probably they can trace it by the heat signature. <laughs> I was, we were, we were talking about uh, the uh, the inevitable end of humanity uh, when North Korea launches a nuclear weapon uh, from there and hits somewhere here. Uh, just, just light, light conversation. Um, I, I don't know about the rest of you. I, long ago, I, I realized I was happy living in Silicon Valley because if someone's gonna bomb somewhere with a nuclear weapon, this is likely to be one of the top spots they'd hit. So I won't. I don't need to be around for the aftermath. There'll there'll be a a bright flash, and then I will no longer be concerned with problems. Uh, is my point. Uh, welcome to July, everyone. Uh, on that happy thought. Um, uh, what have we been doing lately? What have we been doing? Uh, thanks for watching the show, uh, especially if you're watching on Facebook, which we think works this month. Um, stuff we've done lately. Uh, Luan and I we went up to San Francisco. Uh, I think last Friday. It might have been last Friday. It might have been a week before that. I think it was last Friday um, to see, not a musical. I know what you're thinking. You're like, Keith is going to tell us about another musical he saw, like that Hamilton musical. No, not a musical. This was a play, for some reason, an actual play, uh, which is a musical where they don't sing all the darn time. Um, and so in some sense, it's plays are easier to understand. Uh, but musicals, most musicals are at least somewhat happy because uh, it's hard to sing when you're depressed all the damn time. <laughs> uh, whereas at least half of the plays we've gone to, uh, we leave the theater and we're like, that was grueling and depressing and not uplifting in really any way. I mean, the acting was nice, but now I feel bad about my life and now I need to drive home and try to get some sleep. Um, this... This play was not exactly that. Uh, I had aspects of that. Uh, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night, uh, which I guess is a play based on a book, or rather on two books, both with the same name. The, guy, the author, brilliant, brilliant author, uh, in that he realized part of the expense of writing a book is the marketing that eventually has to happen. So he wrote an adult version and a children's version of exactly the same story with exactly the same name probably have different ISBN numbers. Um, and that way they only had to market the book once. Genius people uh, is, is, is the forethought. Uh, and it's, it's a play. Uh, it's set in, I think, England. I'm going to say England, somewhere in England. Um, and it's about uh, like a 15-year-old kid with like Asperger's or some autism or something, because he is not quite right. He's really smart not quite right uh, and someone said uh, bad news uh, the dog dies and I was like well thanks hashtag spoilers and then they're like well the dog dies in the first page like the first <laughs> the first sentence is really I found a dead dog so it's it's not much of a spoiler I mean it's I, I guess if you were gonna read the book and if you're gonna read the book Sorry, uh, but the dog in the title is dead, uh, which is, in a sense, why the incident is curious, uh, I suspect. Uh, and in terms of spoilers, when we get to the play, like before the play, they, first of all, they've opened the theater like 45 minutes early because they want you to buy drinks, really ungodly expensive mixed drinks. Uh, you're paying three times as much for a mixed drink as you should in a theater. Get on that, somebody. Uh, clearly someone could fix this. I'm looking at you, Speaker Ryan. You, you got nothing done in Congress so far. You could pass this. You could pass a law that made it illegal for theaters to sell drinks, uh, especially at shows that are going to make you miserable, for 14 bucks a piece. Just say it. People would love you. Theater-going people, i.e. not your constituents. Um, <laughs> Anyway, back to this. Uh, they want you to come in and buy drinks beforehand, and then they want you to also pony up for drinks uh, at the mid part of the show. Uh, we got there when we got there, about half an hour early, um, because I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Um, and then you go into the theater and you sit in our seats, our seats, third row on the left, 
on the aisle. Greatest seats in the theater. I don't know why everyone else doesn't have them. It's true there are two people in front of us, and those two people could be tall. Occasionally they're tall. That part's not great. Uh, but it's close enough that you can actually see what's happening on the stage uh, when your vision's starting to go wonky and you need glasses all the darn time. Um, we get there, we sit down, middle of the stage, weird stage. It's like covered in, they look like solar panels or something. Um, and just one big, like there's no furniture. Stage, people that do stagecraft are, they, they've left all sensibility behind. Like when I was in high school, I was in the drama club. I know what you're thinking, Keith, clearly you were the lead in a couple plays. No, no. Uh, when I say I was in the drama club, uh, what I mean is I ran the audio for plays and musical. Because I, I was not popular enough to get a role on stage. I'll go further. I was not popular enough to run the lights. See, lighting was a cool job. All the cool kids sat in the back of the theater in the upper little room with the spotlights and they'd zoom the spotlights back and forth, whereas audio, no one wanted to do audio, uh, which is why I ended up doing audio <laughs> uh, all the time. Um, usually audio is not that hard for a play. Uh, the only one I remember being hard at all was uh, in, in high school, they did the, the play Party Line where everyone had a party line telephone and hilarity ensued. Uh, and that one was hard because in addition to running the audio, I had to ring the telephone. So I had a little box, and when I pushed the button, it would make a telephone ringing noise. And when I let go of the button, it would stop making a telephone ringing noise. So first of all, I had to practice to get the rhythm right uh, for, it's a party line. So like if you were the first person, the phone would ring <coughs> once for you, like ring. If you were the second person, the operator would ring it twice, like ring, ring, okay? I had to practice this because the drama teacher was very insistent about the, okay? <laughs> and then I had to sit backstage behind the set and ring the phone because for some reason that's where they wired it to. <laughs> to this day, I don't know why. Um, and then worst of all, this is the worst thing. I know I'm going back. I'm digging up old memories. Uh, <laughs> worst of all was that there was one scene that took place he was at a phone booth, so they, they, they closed the curtains, right? And then the, the lead actor, Nathan Beagie, I believe, I don't know where he is, he's probably still alive. Um, he was out in front of the curtains at a phone booth. Now, I'm backstage, I can't see in front of the curtains. They haven't invented televisions yet, so I can't <laughs> see what's going on. So we had to arrange, they're like, okay, he's gonna answer the phone 15 seconds after the curtains close, right? So the curtains would swing closed, and then I would look, and then I would look at my watch, which still had a second hand back then, <laughs> and then I would I would carefully count 15 seconds for the six performances we did, whatever, right? And then at the thing, I would ring. That was, it, it worked fine for five of the six shows. <laughs> for the sixth show, as it turns out, the guy stage left, whose job it was to close the curtain, did his job. And the guy stage right, whose job it was to close the curtain, did not do his job. <laughs> so the curtain I could see closed, and then nothing. <laughs> so people are standing in front of the curtain, and they're just waiting around. And then suddenly the phone rings. And who, who never heard the end of this for the next month and a half? Me. That's who. Anyway, I've gotten totally off topic. I was, I was talking about... Uh, anyway, I got onto that because that conventional staging, right? It was supposed to be inside someone's house. They put a couch in the stage. It looks like inside someone's house. Another one was supposed to be someone's bedroom. They put a bed in the stage. It looked like someone's bedroom. This one, just one big open box, and they're projecting crap onto the walls, and they're making things, and they're doing weird lighting effects from the bottom and like all the walls, which kind of look like solar panels, had little cupboards, so they'd get things out of the little cupboards and they, it was crazy, it was crazy. Um, anyway, and I got on that whole topic uh, because when you get there and you sit down, smack dab in the middle of the stage uh, is a doll of a dead dog uh, with a pitchfork sticking out of it, uh, which is why I can tell you I've not given anything away when I have explained to you that if you if you go to see The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night, uh, you're going to spend the first 10 minutes while you're waiting for the play to start 
staring at a dead dog <laughs> and wondering who thought this was a good idea. <laughs> and it triggering. Hashtag triggering uh, is maybe what we should think. Uh, okay. It's about a 15-year-old. He has autism. Uh, his parents are divorced because of him, really. And maybe they shouldn't oh have been. It, it's, it's crazy. It's not... Not, not exactly a happy play, and then things happen, and things happen, and there's... I was never exactly quite sure exactly which incident was supposed to be the curious one. Uh, you can eliminate a lot of incidences in the play because they don't occur at night, so it couldn't be the curious incident at night. I'm assuming the curious incident is, in fact, the one that precedes the play, uh, which involves the dog moving from the not dead with a pitchfork in its state to the dead with a pitchfork in its state. Just an assumption. Um, in the end, uh, everything kind of works out. So if you want to go see a vaguely uplifting play, you can see this one. Uh, and if you want to say play with a little bit of math, you could also see this one. I'm sure the book had more math. This one had a little bit of math because the kid's a math genius. Um, that, that was that. Oh, and then, and I told you I would get back to how we get there, uh, which is we, we've been going to this Best of Broadway thing for like 20 years now, maybe for, for a long time. Um, and for many years, we would just get in our car and we would drive to San Francisco. Uh, and I hated that. Uh, cause as you know, driving to San Francisco is miserable cause everyone else also wants to drive to San Francisco and they have all thought to leave one minute ahead of you. So they are all parked in a solid sea of people ahead of you. And you, like you're rocketing up 101 at, you know, 45, 50 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I guess we're just going to sit here for 10 minutes and not move for no good reason whatsoever. Uh, and then you turn on the radio and you listen to traffic. And then they're telling you how traffic is at places with crazy names. They're like, and Hospital Curve has an accident. And you're like, there's no Hospital Curve. We're... Where's Hospital Curve? Is that the, is there a curve near a hospital? And for a while, I was like, it must be a curve near a hospital, except I don't know where the hospitals are in San Francisco. So it doesn't help. Just people, mile markers. Just give me the name of the road and the mile marker number. I'll be happy. Um, that said, we, we've given up on driving to San Francisco. Um, we get in our car uh, and we drive to Daly City. And Daly City is a little miserable to get to for like the last 10 minutes, but it's not terribly miserable to get to uh, and so we drive to Daly City and we park at the BART station in Daly City and then we get in a BART train and we give them four dollars and then they take us that last miserable four miles into San Francisco and then we get off uh, and then we pray we're not murdered while we walk to the fair because um, it's always it's always a potential we'll be murdered walking to the theater Apparently not a lot of people are murdered because I would have heard of it. Um, and then I would stop going. Uh, and I haven't stopped going yet. So, so far, no murders. Um, uh, lately, uh, ever since we passed that proposition in California where you can use legal weed, uh, we've decided the best way to see plays is just very mildly high. Um, so we, <laughs> when we get to the bar station, we will like nibble an edible give it an hour and a half to take effect and then we get to the to the theater and then all of a sudden you'll be sitting there and you're like oh okay that happened and then then you have a play with an incident and a dog just saying people uh you got to think of who your audience is i guess is my big point oh <sighs> uh that was that uh light bulbs um i have a lot of light bulbs in my house because uh, I have a lot of rooms, and I like light. Um, and I've noticed, like a long time ago, I was constantly changing light bulbs. Like every six months, I have to change a light bulb somewhere. Because um, back then, we had halogen lights. Like we'd have 900 watts of halogen light in the living room, because again, I like it bright, people. Uh, and we had like two of those like torch lamps, and the bulbs, you just turn the torch lamp on and go, Geek! Then you'd be sitting in the dark and be like, ah, <laughs> now I got to go to Target and buy a $13 halogen bulb. I don't have any halogen lights anymore. Like uh, a while ago, you know, I, I started to switch my house to compact fluorescents when they were expensive. 
<laughs> and then they kept getting cheaper and they'd they'd last a couple years and they were generally pretty good they'd start to go dim over time like some of them would just slowly dim and some of them like one of the coils would stop going or whatever so i'd but it was a while uh that compact fluorescent uh, and then a couple years ago i was like heck with this i'm just going led because you can't dim compact fluorescent unless you buy expensive ones at buzz and you can dim a lot of leds so i started changing all the light bulbs in my house to led uh, and i think last week i changed the last bulb that was still a compact fluorescent to an led because it hadn't died yet so i had no reason uh, and then one day we get home and i tap the button on the light that's in our stairwell which, by the way, is in a fixture which is hanging 14 feet up in the air. And it didn't come on. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so now I, now I got to buy an LED for that, which is good, I guess. And I bought an LED. I was like, I want to go to good LED. So there's a lot of light up there because there was a crappy thing in there. And I bought an LED bulb. And I got my ladder out, my tall ladder. And then I climbed, positioned it in the stairwell, climbed up it, tried not to die. Again, always a difficult endeavor when you are 14 feet in the air reaching for a thing. And I took the thing down, I screwed the light bulb in, then I, and I discovered that the LED light bulb I bought was about two inches too long for the glass globe to put back on. So I was like, oh. I had to put the glass thing down, and I had to climb down, I had to put the ladder back, and I had to go order another light bulb, because I can't leave that too long light bulb up there forever. Um, I ordered another light bulb, and I, then Amazon delivered it, because that's what they do. For $35, the next day it shows up, and you're like, woo! And then I had to I had to put the ladder back, climb up, unscrew one LED bulb, screw the other one, and put it back. Okay, my goal uh, with all of this story is to explain to you, I am hoping I've changed the last light bulb in my house ever. Because <laughs> they, they generally, they've got like 20, 25 year lifespan. What, so they say. And I've... I've tried to buy the more the, the the better quality ones, and I'm I might have 25 years left in me. I might have 30 years left in me, <laughs> but I'm saying those last four or five years, <coughs> if the light bulb in the stairs going upstairs burns out, I'm not gonna change it. Because <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think I can get a ladder when I'm 25 years from now. Now I've I've been told by my floor director. Uh, relayed uh, from my wife in the other room that I will in fact be changing that light bulb <laughs> even 25 years from now. So, okay, I got that to look forward to. Uh, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be even more exciting than maybe. Maybe I should make a little mental tickler note in my little thingy. Like 10 years from now, I should buy another LED light bulb for the stairwell. And I should just proactively change it 15 years early so that, true, I'm 60, I'm on a ladder, but at least I'm not 85 on a ladder, is what I'm saying. Um, light bulbs, uh, fun all around. Uh, people have been asking, hey, Keith, how's the running going? Uh, as I'm sure you remember, uh, as an avid watcher of the show, uh, <laughs> last year, uh, I told y'all <laughs> that uh, I was jogging uh, and had the goal of running a marathon when I was while I was still 50 years old. Uh, and I got four days left on that. Four days left. I'm not going to manage to fit a marathon in in the next four days, is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, that, that foot thing in January, the plantar fasciitis... <laughs> Screw cancer research people. Put some money in that, because <laughs> that was miserable, okay? And there, when, you're, when, you, when you go to your doctor and he says plantar fasciitis, and then you say, what can you do about it? And then he says, well, nothing really. You just need to stretch it and hope it gets better. That, that's, I bet there's some drug company that's got a very promising drug that they are just keeping off the market because they're waiting for the plantar fasciitis epidemic to hit. And then they can come in and sell it for $3,000. They'll be like, do you want to walk again without your foot hurting and having to put weird 
orange inserts in it. Also on that topic, if you're a company that makes foot inserts, uh, there's an acceptable set of colors for foot inserts. Uh, and that acceptable set of colors <laughs> is black <laughs> and gray. Possibly green, possibly navy blue. Uh, orange is not an acceptable shoe <laughs> insert color for anyone. There's no one that is out in a store <laughs> looking at a shoe insert that's like, oh, I would buy that if it was orange. But I, I don't want to buy it if it's black. I mean, that shoe inserts. Um, anyway, so running wise, uh, I, I am back to jogging like I jogged six miles a couple days ago. Uh, I, as I call it, a half, half marathon. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm hoping to get to a marathon, I'm hoping to do another half marathon this fall. I just pushed everything back like six months to a year. So here's the new thing, which I'm promising you, in the you can't actually hold me to the set. Uh, see, now it's trying to run a marathon before I'm 52. See, I just added a year. I just added a year onto things. I'm sure <laughs> it's going to work out this time. Uh, but on that, to on, that uh, on that very next topic, turning 51, um, uh, I used to think when I turned 50, life was over. Uh, and I was close. Um, in that now I got to start checking a whole new set of boxes. Like demographically, I don't matter anymore at all <laughs> for television watching, uh, which is sad because I still watch more TV than I should. Uh, and unlike 21 to 30 year olds, I actually have enough money that I could buy some of the things I see advertised if I wanted them. Uh, but I also have a TiVo or I have a DVR, so I skipped commercials. So <laughs> I don't see the advertisements. Um, so I don't actually buy anything I see on television. Uh, but I could which makes me think you should not have pushed me into that next set of check boxes. Um, thankfully, I've not been getting terribly much more mail from the AARP <laughs> other than that one flurry uh, just as I turned 50. Um, so <coughs> I guess maybe they, maybe they assume I'm dead <laughs> from standing on a ladder changing the light bulb. Um, the eclipse. There's an eclipse coming up, people. Um, it's like six weeks away at this point. Um, here in California, where I live, uh, it's a partial eclipse. You don't. It's a full eclipse. Other places in America, it's like the first one in 20 years. Um, if you have, if if it's possible. You should plan to go to one of those places and see the eclipse. Because odds are you're not going to see another one. You're probably not one of those people that jet sets off to Australia to see an eclipse just because it's an eclipsing there. Or, you know, charters a, a room on the cruise ship, which is going out of its way to be under. Uh, from here, I'm told you can go up to Oregon. Oregon's lovely. You want to go see the eclipse? Uh, we're going to Nebraska. Because it turns out Loretta's <laughs> sister, her house is in the path of totality. Yeah. My, and it's at like, I don't remember what it is, it's like early afternoon. So my goal is to sleep late <laughs> and then wake up just in time for the eclipse. Be like, Keith, wake up, here's your coffee. Go look at the sun, it's going away. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my goal. That's what I'll be doing. Uh, we, we, booked, we finally booked our flights, so we're flying to Denver. Uh, cause Denver's a lot cheaper than Lincoln and Loretta's sister lives equally inconvenient from both. Um, <laughs> I guess I've lived here a long time. It still astounds me that there are places in this country that are a five hour drive to the closest airport. <laughs> and well, no, that's not the part that astounds me. I mean, I understand how topography works. Uh, the thing that astounds me is people still live there. <laughs> knowing that they are five miles away or five hours away from a metropolis large enough to support an airport. Um, I think there's a there's an Apple store closer to her house, not much closer to her house. I mean, just how how, how do you live there? How do you? What do, uh, we're not going to have a lot more time left. Um, so look, I got to skip some of these topics. Um, oh, people, 
hat. People asked about the hat last time. Um, I have to wear the hat because uh, I because I'm, I'm going bald in the back. So every once in a while, I'm staying outside to wear the hat. Uh, and then tonight, I was like, I should wear the hat. It's easier than trying to brush my hair and make it look presentable. Um, uh, hotels. I also had to book a couple hotels uh, for this eclipse trip, even though we're staying at my sister's house most of the time, right? You got to have a hotel because we're flying out in the morning. You got to have a hotel near the airport because we're flying in. We get there late. We don't have to drive. Um, booking hotels is always tricky because uh, there are some hotels that are just too fancy for me. Like I get to the hotel and I walk in and like someone tries to be really nice to me and like take my bags away and I'm like, no, this is no, this is not going to work. I'm not. I don't feel comfortable. Just, um, and then there are hotels that are that are too skeevy for me, um, where <laughs> you kind of get there and I'm like, mm, no, no, I don't feel. Okay, so there's this there's this like band of hotels in the middle, which are hotels I can I, I can comfortably stay at, um, and the 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 prototypical one, not not the one we always stay at, but the prototypical one to me is I call them all their Holiday Inn Expresses. Right, they're they're kind of classy. They've got the word express in them, um, but like they're not like like Ritz Carlton classy. It's just it's too there's too, there's too much. First of all, they're too expensive, and second of all, I cannot feel comfortable in a Ritz Carlton because every minute I'm there, it occurs to me someone is going to come up and tap you on the shoulder and ask you to leave. <laughs> I'm just going to be like, I'm sorry, sir. We have standards. And you, you are slightly below the bottom edge of our standard, is what we're going to say. We have, at our own expense, booked you a lovely room at a Holiday Express down the road. And our valet will be glad to take your car after you pay $28 for us parking it for six hours. <laughs> and take your luggage, and we will take you to the Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> By the way, they have free Wi-Fi, <laughs> uh, which is really. <laughs> I don't. I don't care so much anymore if hotel has an ice machine, <laughs> but it's got to have free Wi-Fi. I. I don't know why all. I don't know why everyone doesn't have free Wi-Fi, but for God's sakes, the hotel's got to have free Wi-Fi. Otherwise, what are you going to do in the hotel room at night? <coughs> can't watch TV, all the channel numbers are weird. <laughs> and you don't have a DVR. You need Wi-Fi. That's, that's all the time we have tonight, folks. People. I didn't even get to... I was going to talk about fireworks. We had fireworks in Santa Clara. They were nice. Uh, they were cheesy. Uh, and again, they screwed them up. Uh, so if you want to if you want to go to a fireworks show that has a reasonable possibility of being screwed up at least once, July 4th, Central Park, Santa Clara, um, you got to park far away because there's no parking. Uh, we biked over. It was delightful. Uh, and then we sat in our lawn chairs. Uh, and then we watched half of a fireworks show. And we watched a blank guy for four or five minutes. And we watched the other half of the fireworks show with no music because they had already used it. Uh, that was fireworks. Uh, man, I didn't even get to my last topic.